Welcome to StudyClex Explains, where we provide audio notes and analysis on junior cycle and leaving cert topics to get you those top marks. We make exams easier. Hello and welcome to this podcast on the Unseen Poetry Question on Leaving Cert English Paper 2. My name is Peter Tobin, I'm an English teacher and I also have a channel on YouTube called Mr Tobin Leaving Cert English where I've got free videos and other resources for anybody that's studying English for the Leaving Cert. In this podcast we're going to look at the mark scheme for the Unseen Poetry Question, some past questions and the best way to go about answering it to get the most marks. We're also going to look at three unseen poems, so it will be useful to have those poems to hand for later. Those poems are Neutral Tones by Thomas Hardy, Walking Away by Cecil Day-Lewis, and Letters from Yorkshire by Maura Dooley. You'll easily find all three poems online, but you can also find them on the Study Clicks blog, and you could find them as downloads in the description of my Unseen Poetry videos on my channel on YouTube. Okay, so Unseen Poetry is one of the worst answered questions on the entire paper. It's worth 20 marks and the average mark is usually somewhere around 11 out of 20. I'm sure that one of the reasons it's so badly answered is because students don't really think it's important. In fact, the most recent examiner's report for English said that many students didn't even bother answering it at all. But if you think about it another way, the Unseen Poetry question is worth 5% of your final grade in English. And if you found yourself on the borderline between grades, this question could very well be what pushes you into the higher bracket. There's also another way to look at the Unseen Poetry, and that is as a great opportunity. Think about it for a second. You're being given a poem that you're not expected to have any prior knowledge about. You're not expected to have learned off devices, techniques, background or quotes even. All you're being tested on is right there on the page in front of you. And because of this, the mark scheme is actually quite generous. There's a note to examiners on the mark scheme that says explicitly, examiners are not to assume a correct or incorrect response or interpretation and instead to reward students who engage with the poem itself, the language, its suggestiveness and its sensuous qualities. That's the same guidance, by the way, for both higher and ordinary level. What this means is that if you approach the unseen poem in the right way, you can do really well. It's possible to even get full marks. So what does the question actually involve? Well, you're given a poem that you will most likely never have seen before, and then there will be two questions to choose from. Usually one of the questions will have two parts, an A and a B, and each of those will be worth 10 marks each. And the second question will be a single question worth all 20 marks together. You should spend around 20 minutes on this question. So the difference between these questions is all about the level of guidance and support. The first question with the two parts is much more prescriptive. It's telling you what to look for or what to comment on. The second question is much broader. It's more vague and it allows a student to be more creative in their response. The main reason why I think this question is worth doing well is because the mark scheme is so generous. Unlike your single text or your prescribed poetry where you're expected to know about the text, you're expected to have studied it in detail and you're expected to be able to write well about it, in the unseen poem, all the pressure is off. On my YouTube channel, Mr Tobin Leaving Cert English, you will find a downloadable resource that I call my cheat sheet and it's also available for you on the Study Clicks blog. And this cheat sheet gives you a series of questions to ask yourself when you're looking at the unseen poem. They cover all of the things that you need to be aware of when approaching any poem, and probably in order of difficulty, from easiest to hardest, they are literal meaning or message, themes, ideas and mood, language and images, structure and form, and sound, rhythm and rhyme. So we'll go through each of these and look at the questions that you should be asking of a poem when you're looking at these headings. So when it comes to literal meaning or message, the first one, you're looking for the surface or obvious meanings. You can ask yourself questions like, what is happening in the poem? What is the story of the poem? Who is speaking? Who are they speaking to? What hints or clues can you get from the question or the title? And under the heading of themes, ideas or mood, you should be asking yourself, are there any central or obvious themes such as love, death, conflict? 
what do you think the poet is saying on a surface level? Are there any deeper meanings that you can see or even infer? What ideas are explored in the poem? What sort of mood is created? Is it happy, sad, thoughtful, positive, negative? The third area or heading is language and images. And here you should ask yourself, what language devices does the poet use that I can recognise? Can you spot any similes, metaphors or figurative language? Are there any examples of contrast or exaggeration? Are there any powerful or emotive phrases? Are there any interesting word choices? How do these choices help the poet to convey his or her idea or their message? As we go through these headings, they begin to increase in the level of challenge. So the last two we will look at are probably the most difficult of the five. They're challenging because they're hard to spot in a poem that you're unfamiliar with. But if you're aiming for a H1, they will really help you to get the top marks in these questions. And also in your studied poetry as well. So the fourth one is structure and form. And here you can ask yourself, how is the poem laid out? How does it look on the page? Is there a set structure that I can recognise? How many stanzas are there? How many lines are there? Is it uniform throughout or does it change? Where does it change and why might it change in that place? Is it a recognisable form? Let's say like a sonnet or a villanelle. Is there a cyclical structure? Is the poet trying to reinforce a message by revisiting it over and over? Does the focus or the mood or the tense shift or change throughout the poem? The final heading then is sound, rhythm and rhyme. And this could be explored through questions such as, what does the poem sound like? Does it read fast or slow? Is there punctuation slowing you down, for example? Or is there an absence of punctuation that speeds up your reading? Is there a recognisable rhyme scheme? Is it patterned throughout? Does it rhyme at the end of lines or in the middle or does it not rhyme at all? Are there any similar sounding words? Is there half rhyme? Does the poem rhyme at the beginning and stop rhyming somewhere in the middle? So it's important to say here that this approach is just one way of looking at the unseen. And I'm trying to give you a handle on getting started with it, giving you a way into it. There are many other equally valid ways of tackling the unseen poem. So please just consider this way alongside what you're already doing with your own teacher in your own class. Next, what we're going to do is actually see this in action. So for this part, it would be really useful to have a copy of the poem that we're going to look at in front of you. And just as a reminder, uh, you can find these poems online really easily, or you can get a copy on the Study Clicks blog. So I'm going to think aloud as I go through the poem using the criteria from the cheat sheet that we just went through a few minutes ago. And ideally, I'm looking for what I can identify in around five to seven minutes. It's really important to say as well that no one, not even teachers, understand a poem fully after reading it once. There are poems that I've been teaching for 10 years or more that sometimes surprise me with something new when I hear them read a different way or when a student brings fresh eyes to them. So in the time you have available to you, you don't need to identify absolutely everything. You just need to pick out some key elements and then work them into an answer. And as well as thinking aloud, I'm also going to read aloud. And it's crucial that you do that too, especially while you're practicing and learning how to do this. You won't be able to do that in the exam. You won't be able to read aloud fully in an exam. So you need to do as much of that practice work as you possibly can beforehand. Okay, so the first poem we're going to look at is Neutral Tones by Thomas Hardy. We stood by a pond that winter day and the sun was white as though chidden of God and a few leaves lay on the starving sod. They had fallen from an ash and were grey. Your eyes on me were as eyes that rove over tedious riddles of years ago, and some words played between us to and fro, on which lost the more by our love. The smile on your mouth was the deadest thing, alive enough to have strength to die, and a grin of bitterness swept thereby like an ominous bird a wing. Since then keen lessons that love deceives and rings with wrong have shaped to me your face and the god-cursed sun on a tree in a pond edged with greyish leaves. Okay. So the first thing I look at here is the title and that word neutral. Neutral means in the middle. A car is in neutral if it's not in gear. And we say neutral colours are those that don't really stand out. It makes me think of greys or light colours that sort of disappear into the background. After my first reading, my initial thought is that this is about a relationship that has somehow gone bad. The speaker here is talking to a person that he maybe was in a relationship with. 
I can tell from the use of we at the beginning, that collective noun, pronoun we, and you and your from stanza two. So it's like a sort of reverse love letter. The speaker is maybe telling his former lover that their breakup by this pond in winter has damaged him in some way. Remember, whether or not this is what the poet intended does not matter to us. We've seen that the Marx scheme says there is no right or wrong interpretation, so as long as we can justify what we're saying, we can say whatever we want. So the first step is literal meaning and message. We can see it's about a breakup and the message is one of bitterness, I think. Next, we look at ideas, themes and mood. This is relatively straightforward as the mood is definitely a negative one. He talks about love, but it's the ending of love or the pain of love that is focused on. So perhaps some of the ideas or themes here might be love, but also the pain associated with it. Breaking up wouldn't hurt if there wasn't love involved in the first place. As you can see, the first and second steps are closely linked. So now we're at a point where we have a general understanding of the poem. A speaker is addressing a former lover and telling them that their breakup has ruined love for him or her. Some of the deeper themes we can consider are the idea of pain and love being intertwined. These first two steps are necessary, you have to go through them, but they alone won't secure you very many marks. Almost every student who attempts the question will get to this point. The next step then is to start examining the language that the poet uses in order to convey that message. So the first stanza establishes some colour or lack of colour. We have winter, a white sun, the dead grey leaves that had fallen from an ash. So this is a good example of the effectiveness of language chosen for maximum impact. The ash here is an ash tree, but when combined with the word grey, we tend to think of ashes left after a fire and that grey colour that they produce. The next stanza has a simile, comparing the person being addressed, looking at him or her, to looking at some annoying riddle or puzzle. The third stanza has some really interesting language that contribute to the idea of negativity. We have contrast between smile and deadest thing, between alive and die in the line following. Also that bitter grin in the following line. Perhaps the use of contrast here reflects the separation or the opposite nature of the speaker and his lover. In the last stanza, we have again the lack of colour from the first stanza and the emphasis of grey in the last line with the word greyish leaves. So what about the structure and the form here? Well, it's four stanzas and each stanza is a quatrain. That's what we call a four line stanza. And so there's a uniformity to it. It looks regular and even. We notice that the ideas expressed in the first stanza are revisited in the last one. So we can say that there is a circular or a cyclical structure in use. Perhaps this reflects the heartbreak that the speaker is experiencing. It's like a vicious cycle that he's stuck in. And like the poem, he keeps coming back to this moment of heartbreak. So finally, let's take a brief look at sound, rhythm and rhyme. We can see that there's a fairly regular rhyme scheme. In each stanza, the first and fourth lines rhyme and the second and third lines rhyme. So we can say this poem has a rhyme scheme of A, B, B, A. Lots of poems have other sorts of rhyme or no rhyme at all, or words that sort of rhyme, or words within a line that rhyme. But here we have the traditional end rhyme, where the word at the end of a line rhymes with another word at the end of another line. Also with sound, we see that there's alliteration used in stanza one, the starving sod, an assonance in the line, they had fallen from an ash and were grey. Assonance is the repetition of a vowel sound, so A, E, I, O, R, U. Of course, we don't have enough time to go through everything, and ideally, you only need to identify one or two key points about the sound, and an interesting one here comes from the use of rhyme. So the use of rhyme in lines that follow one another helps to build speed. If we look at stanza one again, for example, and the sun, we notice that the two lines rhyming together increases the speed, but so does the word and at the beginning of both of those lines but in particular, the second line. It's as if the speaker is trying to fit in as much into his argument as possible. It sounds almost childish. If we look at the other stanzas, we see that this is a common feature throughout. We call the repetition of a conjunction like and polysyndeton, and that combined with the way the poet increases the pace of these lines creates a very deliberate sensation. And all of this culminates at the end with something very interesting. All of the lines that begin with the word and in the poem rhyme with the line either immediately before or after. Our ear becomes accustomed to it. But at the end, it's the last line that doesn't rhyme with the one before it, that begins with and, and it leaves us with a sense of incompleteness, like we're waiting for something else. 
If we remember the fact that there appears on the surface to be a uniform and steady structure and form, this could suggest the difficulty or the unsatisfied nature of the speaker. It's lurking beneath the surface and only really emerges when we read the poem aloud. So looking at the question, we can see that there's quite a lot there to use. I would suggest that if you are struggling to formulate your own ideas about the poem, or if you are finding it difficult to unpick the rhythm or the sound, then you should go for the two-part structured question. But if you can come up with some interesting ideas of your own, then the second question will afford you more freedom and allow you to get the most marks. I just want to repeat, I wouldn't expect any student to be able to identify all of these things in a poem that they've never seen before in five to seven minutes, first time round. The idea here is to practice using the prompt questions that I've outlined here and that I've got on the cheat sheet to get to the point that you no longer need the sheet and those questions become natural questions that you would ask of any poem that you read. The next poem that we're going to use as an example is the poem Walking Away by Cecil Day-Lewis, who is incidentally the father of the actor Daniel Day-Lewis, although that's not really important to the poem or to the question. I'm going to first look at the question to give myself a hint or idea at what the poem might be about. There are two options. The first has two parts. Question one, part A. What do you learn about the relationship between parents and children in this poem? Explain your answer with reference to the poem. Part B, identify two images that stand out to you in the poem and explain why with reference to the poem. So both of those are worth 10 marks each part. And question two, discuss how the poet conveys emotions and feelings through the language that he uses in the poem. So I've read my question and I've gotten a hint from that question about the nature of the poem. It seems to be about parent-child relationships. As you can see, the first question is more prescriptive than the second, and as I said earlier in this podcast, if you are struggling to find interesting things in the poem, then go for the question that has two parts. But the second one is usually broader, and in this case, it would allow you to talk about more challenging ideas such as sound and structure. Now, the title doesn't give me much more other than someone's leaving. The poem's called Walking Away. So I get the sense that perhaps this might not be a very happy or positive poem. Let's begin with a read through to get a full appreciation of the poem and the sound of the poem. So Walking Away by Cecil Day Lewis. It is 18 years ago almost to the day, a sunny day with leaves just turning. The touchline's new rule since I watched you play your first game of football, then like a satellite wrenched from its orbit go drifting away, behind a scatter of boys. I can see you walking away from me towards the school with the pathos of a half-fledged thing set free into a wilderness, the gate of one who finds no path where the path should be. That hesitant figure eddying away like a winged seed loosened from its parent stem has something I never quite grasped to convey about nature's give and take, the small, the scorching ordeals which fire one's irresolute clay. I have had worse partings, but none that so gnaws at my mind still. Perhaps it is roughly saying what God alone could perfectly show, how selfhood begins with the walking away and love is proved in the letting go. So remember, this poem is unseen, the examiners do not expect prior knowledge and you are being rewarded here for your engagement with the poem. You don't need to identify everything, just enough to differentiate your answer from everybody else's and put yourself in a higher bracket. Also, once you become familiar with these questions, you don't need to approach them in any order. It's simply a toolkit that you can use as you see fit. So we're looking at 20 minutes for this question, approximately five to seven minutes going through the poem, finding material, and the rest on writing up your answer, depending on how quickly you write, of course. So let's begin. The first thing that strikes me about this poem, if you can see it in front of you, is its uniformity. It's four stanzas, and at first glance, they all appear to be the same number of lines, and the lines are roughly the same length. That alone is interesting because remember, everything the poet does is done consciously. It's an active choice from the poet to convey his or her message. Here, the even stanzas don't happen accidentally. A quick read through of the poem also makes it clear there's a rhyme scheme. Examining it a little more closely, we can see that in each stanza, the first, third and fifth lines have end rhyme. So to name the rhyme scheme, we would call it a regular A, B, A, C, A rhyme scheme. In terms of the meaning or the story of the poem, it appears that a speaker is addressing his child. The poem opens with a statement of time. It's 18 years since the speaker watched their child, most likely a son, play their first game of football. It's obvious that the memory is a very powerful one. 
for the speaker because of how clearly and vividly he remembers it. Not just remembering the event almost to the day, but the fact that it was autumn with the leaves just turning and the lines on the pitch freshly painted. The second stanza makes it clear that the boy, instead of going to his father after the game, goes off with the other boys. The third and fourth stanzas shift from a description of a specific memory to an exploration of the pain that the event caused the speaker. My initial suspicion here is that the pain he feels is not simply caused by his son not coming over to him after the match. It's probably much deeper or metaphorical than that. So on a surface level, the poem is addressed to a son and focuses on a memory the father has about when his child was young and metaphorically turned his back on his dad and went off with the other boys and how that father feels about it. If I was trying to develop that idea, I would think about deeper themes and ideas about relationships between parents and children and possibly the theme of growing up. I get the sense that the father feels a natural fear or concern that his son is growing up, but that he's not yet ready for what comes with growing up. And what gives me this idea is the sequence of images that Day-Lewis uses. Probably the most noteworthy thing about this poem after reading it a few times is the strength of the images he chooses. In the first stanza, he describes using a simile, his son going away from him being like a satellite wrenched from its orbit. That verb wrenched is a powerful one. It suggests it's not a natural process and that maybe even it's a violent or a painful one. In the second stanza, Day-Lewis employs a metaphor to compare his son to a small bird. Even if you didn't know that half-fledged means a bird that doesn't have its full wings yet, you could probably hazard a guess that it's only as it's only half ready. And then this underprepared bird is set free into a wilderness. It conveys the concern and worry of the father that his son is not yet ready to be away from his parents. The image in the third stanza is probably one of the most powerful in the poem. Another simile is used to compare the son walking away from the father to a seed falling from a tree. I think by the sounds of it, it's a sycamore tree, the ones with those little helicopter seeds. The seed needs to get as far away from the parent tree as possible in order to stand a chance of growing into a tree itself because it needs sunlight. If it was under the parent tree, it wouldn't get sunlight. So the last stanza acknowledges that this separation wasn't the worst. The speaker has had worse ones, but none that bothered him as much as this one did. There is an element of contrast that works well in this stanza too. This little experience roughly shows what God alone could perfectly show. There's a nice counterbalance to those words, roughly and perfectly, and it sets us up for the final two lines that work very well together in terms of sound. Syllabically, the second to last line is longer than the last, and that gives weight to the final words of the last line. Count the syllables of the lines to see for yourself. The weight of meaning of the poem, that you prove how much you love your children by letting them go to grow up and form their own identities, is reinforced in the final lines and the sound of the lines. The way they run together creates a dramatic finish. Earlier in this podcast, we looked at the poem Neutral Tones, a poem that finishes in quite an unsatisfactory way, with an uneven sound. This poem is brought to a close in a very satisfactory way. And we could also mention the structure here too. We saw how the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, C, A, and this could reflect the father-son relationship. The father is the A lines, so to speak, while the son moves away from him in the B and C lines, but importantly, always comes back just as each stanza ends by rhyming with the first line. So we've spent a few minutes gathering some things to comment on. And remember, you don't have to, and indeed I haven't, picked out everything that you could talk about. The idea here is to cover some bases and then find a few details that will differentiate your answer from everybody else's. The third poem that we're going to look at as an unseen is the poem Letters from Yorkshire by the poet Maura Dooley. As always, first, we're going to look at the question and the title. So question one, part A, what ideas are expressed in this poem? Explain your answer with reference to the poem. And B, can you identify a mood or feeling in the poem and explain how the poet creates it? Explain your answer with reference to the poem. Both of those parts are worth 10 marks. And question two, the other option that's worth all 20 marks is, explain how the poet maximizes the impact of this poem. Make detailed reference to the language used in the poem in your answer. So the questions here don't really give a lot away. There's nothing in them about the themes or ideas, except perhaps in the part B of question one, where it refers to mood or feeling. I'll keep that in mind while I'm reading through. 
the title is a bit more informative, Letters from Yorkshire. Well, Yorkshire is in the north of England, I know that much, and someone is either sending letters from there or receiving them. It could be good or bad news, but the fact that it's letters and not a letter, one letter, makes me think that this could be some sort of relationship and letters are being sent back and forth. And also the fact that it's a letter and not an email or a text or a phone call, maybe the people involved are of a certain age. Also, at first glance, and this is where it's helpful to have the copy of the poem in front of you, I can see that this poem is a single stanza. It's one block, 15 lines long. For a moment there, I thought that it was 14 lines long, and that would be brilliant because a 14 line long love poem is a sonnet. And being able to identify the fact that it's a sonnet would be really impressive to an examiner. They're a really famous form of poetry, and it would be a great point to make. But unfortunately, it doesn't fit the requirements. There are 15 lines, not 14. So let's have a read through for meaning, but also paying attention to sound. Letters from Yorkshire by Maura Dooley. In February, digging his garden, planting potatoes, he saw the first lapwings return and came indoors to write to me, his knuckles singing as they reddened in the warmth. It's not romance, simply how things are. You out there in the cold, seeing the seasons turning, me with my heart full of headlines feeding words onto a blank screen. Is your life more real because you dig and sow? You wouldn't say so. Breaking ice on a water butt, clearing a path through snow. Still it's you who sends me word of that other world. Pouring air and light into an envelope. So that at night, watching the same news in different houses, our souls tap out messages across the icy miles. Okay. So it's clear that there isn't an established or set rhyme scheme like we've seen in the two other poems that we've looked at in this podcast. We would call this sort of poem free verse, but that doesn't mean to say it's random. If we pay attention to the sound, there may be other things that emerge to interest us. Starting from the beginning then, we see that the speaker in the poem is talking about someone. He saw the first lapwings return, but later it shifts to you as if the speaker is addressing him directly. It's an interesting shift because it's not accidental. Again, remember, everything a poet does is a conscious choice and so it's worthy of comment and discussion. So why does the speaker shift? Perhaps it suggests a growing closeness as they send their letters back and forth. Whoever he is, he spends his time outdoors, it seems. The alliteration of planting potatoes makes that phrase stand out. He also knows the seasons. Lapwings are a type of bird that migrate and so when they arrive, it signals the beginning of spring. If you didn't know that, it's not the end of the world, because you could get to the same idea in different ways. We see the phrase, seeing the seasons turning, shortly after that phrase about lapwings, and it conveys the same idea. There's a technique which becomes quite important in free verse poems, and it's called enjambment. It's when a sentence or an idea doesn't finish at the end of a line, and it runs over onto the next one. You can see examples of it in this poem in line two to three, so it came indoors, and a very apt and clever use of it in line six into seven, the seasons turning. Enjambment is something that creates junctions in the language that can help create or enhance meaning. With a minute pause when we read, enjambment can increase the power or reinforce the meaning of certain words depending on where they are placed. So for example, the pause between the word seasons and the word turning from line six into line seven, enhances that idea of turning. The seasons turn as the poet turns the line. There's also another technique we're mentioning here that you would probably have heard about in class, and that's called caesura, literally meaning to cease or stop. A caesura is a pause in the middle of a line of poetry. Sometimes it can be a full stop. Sometimes it's a comma or a dash. We see a good example of it in line five, where the poet writes, it's not romance, comma, simply how things are. So this line is a statement that is supposed to stop us romanticizing country life. The idyllic image of the man of the land tending to the soil and watching the birds. The speaker is telling us this is just life, it's not romantic. The use of the caesura and the single line sentence immediately after the sentence spanning four lines gives the statement power by slowing the reader right down as they read that line. It's much more emphatic. The speaker then seems to draw comparisons between his life and hers. Is his somehow more real or authentic because he works the land and she seems to be a writer of some sort? There's a physical distance between them too. He's in Yorkshire working the land and sending her letters. We don't know where she is, but we know that she's not with him and she's not in Yorkshire. 
but there's also another sort of distance between them in the sort of lives they lead and the work that they do. If we look again at lines 9, 10 and 11, we can see an example of rhyme that isn't end rhyme, the most common type. Instead, it's internal rhyme. And to get the full appreciation, we must hear it again. The so, S-O-W, at the end of line 9 means to plant. But this is echoed by the so, S-O, in line 10. It creates something we call euphony, which is a pleasing sound. And this is enhanced further by the word snow in line 11. Is your life more real because you dig and sow? You wouldn't say so, breaking ice on a water but clearing a path through snow. By the end of the poem, we can see that despite the distance, there is a connection between them and this feels positive. I would suggest that the mood in the poem is positive despite their difficulties. At night, they watch the same news in different houses and this is quite a comforting image. There's a shared experience between them, a connection and that last line, their souls connected, sending messages to one another across the icy miles, also suggest an air of positivity. There's a pleasing sound to the last line. The assonance and sibilance at work in Across the Icy Miles creates a sort of haunting finish. It reminds me of the fog or steam that we breathe out when it's very cold. Okay, so let's sum up and come back to our questions. This is a poem about two people. Their relationship is unclear and we don't need to know any more about their relationship. They're separated physically by distance, but there's also an emotional or another type of separation, the work that they do and the lives that they lead. There are lots of images of the man and the land, farming, breaking ice, clearing snow, watching the birds that establish his connection to nature, while there is really only one image of the speaker, typing, feeding words onto a blank screen. When she asks the question, is your life more real because you dig and sow? It seems clear that she thinks it is. Structurally, it's a 15 line long single stanza and there's some internal rhyme but no set rhyme scheme. There's some use of caesura and enjambment to focus the reader on particular parts of the poem, particular key ideas. There's also use of sibilance, assonance and alliteration. Looking at our questions then, how could we form these ideas into a response? Well, as I've said previously, which question you do depends on how much you can get out of the poem. If you're struggling to find interesting things to say, then go for the question that has more structure, the two 10 mark questions. But here I think I'd probably go for question two. The question asks us how the poet maximizes the mood or the feeling in the poem, and I think that we've got plenty from this poem to give a really good answer. Obviously, first you need to decide what the message or meaning is so that you can say what the impact is. Here, I would be inclined to focus on human connection despite emotional and physical distance. There's lots of references to the natural world in the poem, and it seems to me that human connection is equally natural and fundamental as the seasons changing and the world turning. Despite the distance, as we see at the end, our souls are connected. We then need to look at how that is conveyed. We've already mentioned the natural imagery, the pictures of the natural world, but we could also talk about the use of enjambment and caesura to focus the reader on these ideas as well as the really clever use of sound in the last lines. I hope that you found this podcast useful to your study of the Unseen Poetry question. For more information on the Unseen or other aspects of the Leaving Cert English course, please check out my channel on YouTube, Mr. Tobin Leaving Cert English. Thank you for listening. Good luck. And make sure to download the resources that are available for this podcast from the Study Clicks blog. A big thank you to Peter for providing such a clear and comprehensive breakdown of the Unseen Poetry section on the Leaving Cert English exam. This podcast was produced by StudyClicks. If you don't have an account with StudyClicks already, we'd highly encourage you to set up one for free today and get access to brilliant resources like notes, sample answers, exam questions by topic, quizzes and so much more. If you'd like to get in touch, you can message us on any of our social media platforms through the chat box on StudyClicks, or you can drop us a quick email at info at studyclicks.ie. And we'd like to remind you that you can check out Peter's YouTube channel for brilliant free content on the Leaving Cert English course. You can find a link to his channel in this episode's description. And finally, if you liked this podcast or you found it really helpful, we'd really appreciate it if you took the time to give us a five-star review wherever you're listening to this, just so more people can find it too. Thanks for listening, and we hope you stay tuned for more. <laughs>